Hello and welcome to this presentation on art and music. I've got a lot to get through, so I'm probably going to talk too fast. Apologies. Fasten your seatbelts. Before I get on to the main subject, I'll just introduce myself very quickly. I'm James Mayhew, and you might know me as a children's author and illustrator. And I'm here in my studio right now. This is where I make the books. This is where I, I do my illustrating. The writing, actually, I do anywhere, but uh, this is where I do the illustrating. And you might know some of the books. Uh, recent ones are things like Gaspar the Fox or the Mrs Noah series, uh, which I've illustrated. But I've also written some books too. The Ella Bella Ballerina series. Um, this book, Koshka's Tales. Or my very first book of all, Katie's Picture Show. But about 12 years ago, I started working with musicians and orchestras. And this has been one of the most exciting and satisfying parts of my whole working life. I absolutely love music, so it means a great deal to, to me to be able to work with musicians, because I'm not a musician myself. And the way it happened was I was speaking at a festival, I was telling a story at a festival, and it was the story of the Firebird. And I was doing a painting as well as telling the story. And the organiser said, this is great. We've got the art, we've got the words. All we need now is the music. And I said, you mean a CD? And they said, no, 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 no. we mean an orchestra. So they introduced me to this orchestra who wanted to put on a family concert. None of us knew if it would work. But it did. We, we presented the Firebird. I told the story. I painted illustrations during the performance of the music. It was all projected up onto a big screen and, uh, and everyone seemed to love it. So I've been doing that ever since with more and more orchestras, more and more uh, musicians and ensembles, sometimes soloists. And, and even with um, pop music too, I've done some work with uh, Tanita Tikaram, for example, just last week. So it's a very, very broad um, potential here I think. Most of my work though is with classical music. I think that's probably where it's got the most potential to be properly cross-curricular because it's, it's going to cover more geography, more history as well. So the way it works when I do this project in the classroom is that I, I select some pieces of music, I do a little bit of research behind them, and I present those, those to the children and I bring in a CD of the recordings. Obviously I don't bring an orchestra with me. And uh, the way I work it is that I do a presentation first where I demonstrate how I illustrate music. So I will probably bring an easel or ask for a flip chart and, um, and, and pop a board up there. And as the music plays, I will paint in time to the music. I start when the music starts and I stop when the music stops. And I try to choreograph the mark making to match the mood of the music faster when it's energetic music or more gentle and, and uh, liquid when the music is more graceful. And I also vary the tools I use. Um, in a concert I'll use very, very silent tools because I have to. I have to use things like inks and paints because they don't make any noise. But in a classroom you can use pastels and things like that. And pastels are actually very, very good, particularly oil pastels, because they don't need fixing. And oil pastels give you immediate colour. One of the things I like doing is getting the children drawing on black, uh, because that kind of levels the playing field immediately. And by beginning where the music begins and ending when the music ends, usually these pieces of music are maybe 10 or 12 minutes long, it gives them a real focus. And one of the things I've found really fascinating is how many uh, troubled children actually are autistic or um, dyslexic or perhaps from, from uh, just uh, having a sad day or even elective mutes have started talking. Uh, it's been wonderful to see how they've been drawn out. Not because of me, because of the music. Music is a very powerful communicator, uh, an international language. Now you might be thinking, I wouldn't know where to begin. This requires so much research. How do I even start? It's just too complicated for me. Well, I'm here to help you. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen in a few minutes a list of pieces of music that I think would be useful to you. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how I research and how I prepare. So many of the pieces of music that I'm using are based on myths and legends, established stories which are, are, are out there. And those are the kind of pieces that I choose. Some of them are very famous pieces that you would recognise immediately, and some of them might be less familiar but actually really effective with a class, uh, as I found out through, through trial and error, really. Um, so once you've chosen a piece or several pieces of music that you want to work with, you find a, a version of the story that you're prepared to tell. Now, obviously, I'm going to demonstrate how I paint to the music. You might not feel comfortable doing that. You don't have to. You can just do some research. You can Google images that will go with that piece of music. Uh, if it's a piece of music set in a particular country, like if it's set in, I don't know, Norway, if it's Pier Gint and the Trolls, then you might want to look at Norwegian mountains and the sort of houses they have there and the fjords, that kind of thing. So it's about giving children uh, an understanding of the environment that the music is, is inhabiting, so that when they do their illustrations, they're not just sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know what it looks like. They've got a clear idea in their head. 
One of the great things about this project, incidentally, is that once they've done this, is uh, usually they want to hear the music again. Usually the 10 minutes isn't long enough. So we repeat the music. We say, hey, do you want to hear Stravinsky again? And you'll say, yes, which is a fantastic outcome. So they're going to listen to the music several times, probably during a lesson. And that gives them more time to finish their art. At the end of the lesson, at the end of the session, they have a piece of art which is theirs. They feel real ownership over that piece of art and it helps them remember the story. So it's a great lead into literacy now. You, you have an established image which they made, it's theirs. It's, it's an illustration, so that's the art covered. Into literacy, you can either continue the story, what happened next, or you can retell the story, or you can find different variations on the theme of the story. It's a very rich thing being able to listen to a piece of music and think, well, what does it suggest? What words would you use to describe that moment in the music? Now wait, the music's going to change. What happens now? What words describe it now? So it's a very fluid, moving forward kind of thing. Music doesn't stand still, it keeps moving. And that really helps with writing. If you're stuck, play a piece of music. Keep the children moving forward. Obviously with uh, history and geography, it's very uh, easy where you begin. Um, if, if we take a piece of music, let's say um, the William Tell Overture by Rossini, he's an Italian composer, so you can look at Italy, you can talk about pasta and pizza and all of that. But the story of William Tell is actually set in Switzerland, so then you can look at cheese and clocks and anything you like to do the Switzerland mountains, the Matterhorn. Uh, history. Was William Tell a real person? Well, perhaps he was. A bit like Robin Hood, we're not quite sure, but there's a big statue of him in, in Switzerland. He's very celebrated there. So there's history behind the, the legend. There's also the history behind uh, the composer. Rossini was famous not just for his music, but also for inventing pasta recipes, as it happens. So there's many, many interesting strands you can go off on just from that. So I'm very aware that we're going to run out of time, so I want to tie this up very quickly. Um, I've just been working on a book which won't be published now until next year because of the virus, unfortunately, but it's called Once Upon a Tune. I think it will be a very useful resource for classrooms um, because it has six uh, fantastic well-known stories which have been set to classical music. And they are William Tell, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, Scheherazade, lots of different stories. So that will be, I think, um, something to look out for next year if you like the, the idea of this, you like the sound of it. And the other thing I'd like to tell you about very quickly is a, a Patreon channel which I'm working on with a couple of musicians and it's called A Brush With Music and there's a, a, a school's tier where you can buy in um, the films and you can get lots of teacher's notes, colouring in sheets, you even get a, a Skype Q&A as all part of the deal. So for less than the cost of a single day's author visit, you could have a year's worth of content of films and teacher's notes um, all around the subject of painting to music. And now, because we have only a very short period of time left, I'm going to finish with a demonstration of a piece called The Flight of the Bumblebee. Um, it's probably the shortest piece of music in, in my painting repertoire. It's actually really hard to do an illustration to this, but it will just give you the general idea. So this piece um, comes from an opera by Rimsky Korsakov, a Russian composer, and it's a Russian story. And the story is, is very convoluted. I haven't got time to tell it now, not without time, overrunning the time. But essentially it's about a prince who um, is turned into a bumblebee by a magic swan, a swan princess. And he flies off back to Russia to find out why his father threw him into the sea when he was a baby. So here comes the Flight of the Bumblebee by Rimsky-Korsakov and thank you very much for watching. Bye!